Welcome back to the All American Legacy Podcast. This is Lieutenant Colonel Joe Buccino. Today is part one of a two-part series on D-Day. These two parts are hosted by our friend Major Doug Ray. Before we go into our standard podcast intro, we're going to play you a few voices from 82nd Airborne Division veterans from D-Day. The first day, the 508, first 508 jumped in Army. They lost the entire chain of command, not captured, not wounded, all of them killed. Colonel Batchelor, battalion commander. Captain Ruddy, the company commander. Lieutenant Sneed, battalion leader. First Sergeant Snuffy Smith, the first sergeant. And Alvin C. Carter, my sergeant. All of them killed the first day. Vargas's head was at my shoulder and a shell hit right to his right side and blew his uh, leg and thigh apart. So I stayed with him and I tried to, uh, to do whatever I could to ease his pain. I gave him a shot of, of penicillin. We thought that we were going to be dropping in uh, sort of Meadowlands. I personally was standing in the door from the time we hit landfall until we uh, got to the uh, uh, drop zone area. We were flying at a very low level and I went out and got about one full oscillation after opening of my parachute and I hit the water and went under. We were all scared. There's no doubt about it. We were quiet. We weren't saying too much. And when we hit the coast, it looked like the 4th of July, all the anti-aircraft were firing at us. The smoke was Black. And when we, the pilots were getting scared because they was wanting to get out of there. They thought maybe, they, well, like us, they didn't know if they was going to make it back to England or not. This is the 82nd Airborne Division, fearless among fighting units. From Fort Bragg, home of the Airborne and the center of the military universe, this is the All American Legacy Podcast. Go! An inside look at the 100-year history of the 82nd. They are all American all the way. From a letter written by Colonel John McNally, 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment, to his sister Margaret just after D-Day. Finally, bulky and shapeless, with guns, knives, rations, ropes, maps, and food, we climbed into the waiting plane. The sunset glowed red, and a cold wind started to blow. We smelled again the old familiar scent of high-octane gasoline, hot metal, and airplane fabric. We sat down and tightened our straps as the motors roared and the plane vibrated. As the crew chief came through and slammed the door shut, we knew that the next time we went through it would be over France. I wouldn't trade those moments for anything in the world. With pride and tenseness, we sat side by side, the common loneliness of men dissolved in the white heat of the coming hours. We knew that we were going in ahead of everyone else and would be alone behind the German lines for hours, and upon our efforts depended in a large measure the success of the storming of the beach. As ever, John. Anzio. Argonne. Camp Gordon. Swift. York. Pike. These are the names and places that defined the 82nd Airborne Division prior to June 6, 1944. They are important not just for us in America, but for world history. The 82nd Division, formed in 1917 to fight along the Western Front in World War I, was reborn as an Airborne Division for World War II in 1942. The All-American Division became a respected fighting force in the Crucible of Italy and Sicily in 1943. While our history prior to June 1944 is widely recognized, Operation Neptune, the D-Day assault operation in Normandy, France, would make the 82nd Airborne Division legendary. After D-Day, the world would know the All-Americans. I'm Major Doug Ray. This is a special two-part All-American Legacy podcast episode, The Day Before the Day. In this episode, we will honor the defining moment in our history. We will cover these two episodes in four acts. Act 1, Neptune. 
The Normandy invasion was perhaps the riskiest and most important operation our civilization has ever undertaken. June 6th is honored throughout Europe and the United States. It is one of those days marked on calendars all over the world. It is one of those days that changed the world. But our paratroopers went into France on June 5th. The 82nd, along with the 101st, would spearhead the Normandy invasion. Keith Nightingale, a D-Day historian and retired Army colonel who served in the 82nd, knows the enormity of Operation Neptune and spoke with Lieutenant Colonel Joe Bacino from the All-American Legacy podcast. Nightingale toured the D-Day battlefields with Generals Ridgway and Gavin in 1984, the 40th anniversary of the invasion. He lives D-Day and knows its magnitude. Keith tells us that the Division Airborne Assault into Normandy almost did not happen. When Montgomery and Eisenhower came to the Mediterranean and reviewed the initial plans for the invasion, they saw that the invasion beachhead areas had to be greatly widened from what was the original plan and that the flanks had to be secured in order to preserve the force, if you would. There was great concern over the German armor capabilities, and they had to pick an area to land where that would be negated. And the only place to do that was Normandy. They selected with the original plan, they greatly expanded it, so it covered about 120 kilometers, which is quite a large array. And they saw immediately that there were two great nodes on each flank that had to be secured before the invasion. The two flank locations had to be secured before the beach invasion mm -hmm. because if the Germans were able to occupy these areas on the flanks, they could threaten the beaches dramatically and possibly defeat the Allies in the detail before they could get a force ashore. Well, the only units that could get in ahead of the seaboard assault were airborne units. The 101st was assigned to the high ground overlooking the beach, and the 82nd was assigned to the ridge line centered at St. Mariglis that held the high ground that would prevent the Germans from coming into the invasion area. And equally importantly, would act as the location for the counter final major attack by Allied forces once they got off the beach directly west to cut the peninsula and isolate Normandy completely. The 82nd was crucial to the overall invasion force. They could not fail. Trafford Lee Mallory, who was the British Air Force uh, the head of the British Air Force uh, for the planning, looked at the ground and looked at what the Germans uh, had been able to do in Crete and Belgium and what their new defensive capabilities were, which were formidable. Looked at that and said, you know, we're going to sacrifice these people. I'm not sure it's really necessary and that we will take horrendous casualties in doing it, I recommend we rethink this whole proposition. Gavin and Ridgway were also very concerned about the inexperience of the transport pilots, that they had never been in the combat before, that when the anti-aircraft started working, that they would scatter like quail, which in fact they did. But that was also a major concern internal to the division because of the inexperience of most of the transport pilots. There was a belief among many people in the Army that airborne wouldn't work. It was too risky, too chancy, too prone to bad things happening. And of course, Gavin Ridgway supported it very strongly. At that time, Bill Lee at the 101st, but there was a lot of people in the Army that were shaking their heads and saying maybe this is not such a good idea. And it was very risky. The whole planning was built on risk mitigation. This wasn't a combat assault more as much as it was a logistics operation to secure the Cotton Peninsula 
to reduce German counterattack capability and open up the port of Cherbourg. The whole thing was basically a security operation to get Cherbourg open and functioning where the reinforcements could bring in forces that were then believed could be strong enough to beat the German army. The Germans at that time had something in the neighborhood of 40 divisions in France, and it absolutely depended on the success of the 82nd and the 101st in that area just south of Cherbourg. The fate of the war, the fate of the entire world, would rest on these two airborne divisions, the 82nd and the 101st. They would lead this massive invasion force. They would hold until relieved. They could not fail. Operation Neptune was undoubtedly the most important moment in this division's history. It is among the most important moments in American history. The thrust of American power could have turned had the all-American paratroopers not stood firm in the face of danger. Our men shaped the modern world. Operation Neptune and our role in it did more than facilitate the defeat of Nazism. It did more than help expel tyranny from Europe. This operation, this enormous invasion, changed the way the world thought about American power. The way the country and even the West itself thought about the role of America in the world changed after D-Day. This was the biggest thing we had ever done. The biggest thing the world had ever seen. And we pulled it off. America could not lose again. If Americans could do something this big, this ambitious, this important, well, then Americans could do anything. From D-Day on, the United States would be the guarantor of world order. When we went into Normandy, when Ridgeway there, uh, and, and Gavin was talking to us, they told us that our casualty rate would be 85%. So we lived day by day, you know, no one, we knew that it was going to be very difficult to get out of there. Yeah, I, I was scared, but I was scared that maybe I wouldn't do my job right, uh, which I wanted to do, and life depended on my job, and my buddies depended on me doing it right. The uh, plane ride coming across was uh, very somber. Uh, there wasn't too much discussion. There was a lot of boys thinking about, you know, just what's going to happen and uh, what are we getting into. But uh, there wasn't too much uh, conversation going on. We uh, more or less kept everything to ourselves and I think visualized life at home and prayed to the good Lord above that he's saved us and uh, sac didn't sacrifice us. The All-American Legacy Podcast is the story of ordinary men and women doing extraordinary things. Eisenhower gave the paratroopers only a 50% chance to complete their mission. Think about that for a moment. The commander of the entire operation gave the All-Americans a 50-50 shot at success. Stepping into darkness, heavily laden with equipment, with a parachute, or slamming into the earth in a glider, all while under intense enemy fire is indeed the very definition of extraordinary. They knew the odds against them, yet they went anyway. These men had a sense of bravery, kinship, and purpose, perhaps unrivaled in American military history before or since. Our D-Day paratroopers are the soul of this division, and always will be. In January 1944, the All-Americans left Italy and North Africa and moved to England to prepare for the cross-channel invasion. In England, the division trained on airborne operations. Here again is Colonel Keith Nightingale on training in England. And Gavin and Ridgway designed what they felt was the best training program for the troops based on what they knew about where they were going, which, by the way, was a secret to the troops, uh, as well as their own previous experience in North Africa and Sicily. The first is a lot of night jumps. They knew that this would be a night operation and that there would be a lot of scattered people and they wanted to get the troops confident that they, regardless of what a mess it was, they could figure it out and sort it out on the ground and still accomplish the mission. So night jumping was a significant part of the program in the beginning. 
later on in the early May period, they pretty much ceased it because of injuries. They couldn't afford to lose any more soldiers, particularly leaders, NCOs and junior officers. So they greatly reduced the amount of night jumps. But what they then did is they increased a great deal of the road marches, night operations, night attacks. Both of the generals told me that they had a high degree of confidence that the troops know how to assault a position or defend a position. They didn't spend much time doing that. The bulk of their time uh, was spent on conditioning exercises and what they called mental confidence exercises. They substituted deuce and ass for airplanes, and they would take troops out in the middle of the night and drop them at some unknown location and give them a mission to get back to a different location and accomplish objectives along the way. That reduced the injuries and at the same time got the troops out in the dark. They had interregimental baseball and basketball, volleyball, and flag football. But Ridgeway had one particular rule, and that was you had to have mixed teams. In other words, you couldn't just take A Company and B Company. You'd take four guys from A Company, first bat, and three guys from B Company, second bat, and four guys from C Company, third bat, and you'd put them together as a team, and you'd change that every day. And his point was that they had to get used to working together because he knew after they jumped, they would meet up together. They had to have confidence in each other and get outside of their comfort envelope in terms of, you know, this is my squad, my platoon, my company. They trained as those units, but when they did the athletics, they intentionally mixed them up so that the troops were used to working, you know, cross elements and had confidence in each other. And the other one was they gave them a lot of time off downtown in the pubs. They were a discipline problem because the 82nd troops would get in fights with the legs. And the MPs who were trying to, you know, keep order and discipline in these towns went to Ridgeway and Gavin and consistently said, hey, would you please bring your people under control? You've got to discipline them more, et cetera. And Gavin and Ridgeway would say, yes, we'll look into it. And they basically didn't do a whole lot. And that was by design. With this training behind them, the division was ready to jump into hell. There was one man uniquely capable of leading them there. I remember before we went into Normandy, General Gavin stood on the hood of a Jeep And he says, you look to your right and look to your left, because two out of three of you may not come back. He says, but you're expendable, but you have a job to do, and I expect you to do it. And by the time he got through talking to you, you were ready to go to hell and back. But that was Gavin. You just admired him, idolized him. Act Two. Jumpin' Jim. In the 82nd Airborne Division, we don't send our paratroopers to jump. We lead them out the paratroop door. Our leaders jump first. That notion of leadership is in our bloodstream. It's traced back to one man. By the spring of 1944, Jim Gavin was 37 years old. He was the youngest Brigadier General ever in our Army. He would spearhead the most important mission in U.S. history. Gavin was appointed the Assault Force Commander for the 82nd Airborne Division, one of the key spearhead airborne divisions to land in Normandy before the main force and to hold until relieved. Prior to this, he had joined the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment at Fort Benning as a captain. As a colonel, commanded the entire regiment in Sicily and Salerno. He had a well-earned reputation as an effective combat commander. Most importantly, he had the deep love and respect of his soldiers, He truly was a leader worthy of the lead. Jim gave his paratroopers a will, a sense of purpose, and resolve that would see each through D-Day in one of the most confused and risky battlefields in which they ever would fight. General Gavin had been appointed by the division commander, Major General Ridgway, a formidable soldier in his own right, 
as the assault force commander for the entire division. Gavin and his men would go in on the night of June 5th, the day before D-Day. General Ridgway would follow behind the assault force the next morning, June 6th, approximately six hours after the initial parachute insertion. To this point, the actual objective area was withheld from the general troop body. By May, the 82nd was in England to train for the airborne assault. The troops knew they were going to France. But where, when, and how remained a mystery and the subject of scuttlebutt, that is until less than two weeks before the assault. It was important to both Gavin and Ridgway that the troops hear from their leadership top-down on what their fate would be. It would not be passed by paper, mimeographs, and telegrams. The human leadership would lead. Gavin's plan was simple and born of his previous experience. Paratroopers want to see the man who will spend their souls. He had spent his time in combat up front at the toughest places at the toughest times. To his soldiers, he was a force of nature and one of them. Where he led, they would assuredly follow. He would talk to them face to face, just as he had done at Piazza Ridge, across the many hot and dusty roads and villages of the grinding combat of Sicily and the tense beachhead at Salerno with German armor staring them down. He was one of them and would communicate as he had always done when it truly counted, face to face and close. Each regiment on schedule, assembled in an open area, Treated to the cool and misty English weather, the battalion stood close together in parade formation. He arrived in his jeep and parked close to the troop's center of mass. He mounted the hood of the jeep and commanded all to gather around him. In a minute, 1,000 plus airborne soldiers were gathered around as closely packed as humans could be. They had the studied anxiety and interest of veterans and knew now, with this man, the answers to their key questions. All else would follow. Those that were there described it as a moment as quiet as a thousand held breaths could bring. Looking at the sea of faces, he said in a clear parade ground voice that easily carried to the furthest ranks, I will not send you to Normandy. I will take you there. With this simplest yet most eloquent statement, each of his soldiers knew they wanted to go, who they wanted to go with, and that they would win. That is a gift beyond price for any leader and his men. The many would be one, and we would win. Here is one of those paratroopers who heard that message in his own words, in a dramatic reading by our Sergeant David Greeson. Picture, if you can, a general who, arriving a little ahead of time and seeing the waiting soldiers being entertained by a GI doing car tricks, would stand unnoticed and wait until the little act was over before coming out to speak. Then he started talking in his quiet way, punctuated once in a while by a slow, tentative smile. He has the intense eyes and lined mouth of a man who has fought the Nazis a long time and well. I watched the faces of the men as he talked. It was as though an electric shock had gone through the whole group. When he talked, every man felt drawn into the company of the elect who, for the space of a breath, risked their lives a thousand feet above the ground. When he had finished, he needed only to lift a finger and say, Follow me! And there wasn't a single man who wouldn't have followed him straight to hell. Throughout his time in England, Gavin corresponded with his daughter Barbara, who was ten at the time. On June 5th, General Gavin sent his daughter Barbara a letter about the impending mission. Here is that letter. Dear Barbara, It is now evening. We take off tonight. As well as we can foresee our needs, everything has been provided for. I thought that before going, I would drop you a line and perhaps give you some idea of what makes Pappy tick at a time like this, or, for that matter, what makes them, troopers of the 82nd Airborne, all tick. It does appear at this stage to be about the toughest thing we have tackled. I have tried to get some sleep this afternoon, but to no avail. Too many well-meaning well-wishers have come by to get in the last word. The boys all look fine. They all are in tip-top shape. This has been quite an experience working with them the past several months. I've never seen, heard, or know of soldiers like these combat experienced parachutists. For us older professional officers, it can be taken for granted that we will do whatever duty requires, but for these young lads, just from school, the farm, or home, it is quite an undertaking. With few exceptions, they are highly idealistic, gallant, and courageous to a fault. They will take losses to do anything. 
Needless to say, it has been a source of considerable gratification to have the privilege of working with them. Someday you will no doubt wonder why in the world I got into this business when there are so many apparently safer ways to go to war. And I expect that by the time you are old enough to wonder in an analytical way, the reason will be evident throughout our service. Because, you see, someday most of our army will be either airborne or readily capable and trained to be airborne. Nowadays one reads in some newspapers that bombing will win the war without the aid of ground forces, and in other papers that the ground forces can accomplish anything without the Air Corps. Manifestly, someone is wrong. Actually, neither of them completely, because the answer lies in combining the air bombing with air transporting of troops. During this present phase of our development, the participation of airborne troops in the form of parachutists offers particular hazards because of the newness of our technique. But in time, parachuting, or what will take its place, will be no more dangerous than riding a tank is today. Until then, therefore, if progress is to be made, risks must be taken and of course will be taken by those who believe in what they are endeavoring to accomplish. The presence of danger in present-day airborne operations isn't the bad thing that it is made out to be anyway. It is an essential in that it exacts of the participants peculiar qualities of courage. These things all contribute to making a soldier what a soldier is, reputedly supposed to be, and what we especially need in an airborne soldier. I will write you as soon as I am able. I am enclosing some invasion money. By the time you receive it, the shooting will have started, and so I am sure I am not violating any security. Love to everyone, Pappy. It is clear that Gavin understood the magnitude of what he was about to do. Last month, our Lieutenant Colonel Joe Bacino spoke with Chloe Gavin, Jim's youngest daughter, about her father's role in the D-Day operation. When I was five years old, my father had me jumping out of the second-story windows into snowbanks as paratrooper training. And Life magazine came to visit, and we had photographs of this. And I grew up with my father retired, but the 82nd was always first in his heart and very dear to him. And I grew up hearing about paratroopers and all the battles they fought in and knowing they were the finest soldiers the Army has. You know, my, my dad talked to me once when I was a teenager because he was doing a watercolor. He liked to paint. He did oils and watercolors. He was doing a watercolor. I said, what is that? And he said, well, we jumped into Normandy. You know, they landed in this marshy area, and all their equipment bundles went underwater. And they were trying desperately in the first few minutes after landing to get the equipment. And they didn't have a lot of success. But he had a picture still in his mind, and this probably was 30 to 40 years later, of a trooper who stripped off his uniform and was diving in the water in the full moonlight trying to get the equipment bundled. And he was still trying to sort of get this on paper. So these things stayed with him, the images and the memories. I have my dad's unpublished diary from the war. And I also have uh, an autobiography he wrote. So most of this is from the diary. That's very immediate language. November 25th from London. He talked at a staff meeting. British Brigadier General emphasized the difficulties of cross-channel operation. One, there were only four or five days during a month when the tidal and meteorological conditions were satisfactory for an amphibious effort. The airborne troops desire favorable moon conditions. The probability of combining points one and two to stage a successful attack had been calculated at 100 to 1 against such a thing occurring. This is about trying to get the officers in the battalions and in the regiment in shape. I'm no doubt in making many enemies in this army by refusing to retain or condoning the retention of inefficient unit commanders. I cannot see any other course. Many lives are at stake. I've been a bit ruthless and have hurt many people, but I have had many people killed too. This is Monday, April 24th. Our area is going to be an inferno the night of D-Day. Here, I'll read you. This is May 4th, so they're only a month away. Sometime with training, visited brigade twice during the past 24 hours. The 508 is shaping up very nicely. The 82nd is to lead in. The pathfinders drop at 2350 hours and the first troops at 022. I will be with that group. It is fine for the morale of the 505. They are again to lead the invasion. The entire affair looks much better now than it did some time ago. I hope that I live through it. This is Thursday, May 25th, 1944. 
I visited the 505, 507, and 508 this morning. They are in as good shape as we can get them under present circumstances. They're confident and certain of their ability to do the job. It's inspiring to contact parachute troops about to go into combat. They are so sure of themselves. They will do a good job and is just as well. Either this 82nd Division job will be the most glorious and spectacular episode in our history, or it will be another little bighorn. There is no way to tell now, but we are going in, and they will, I am certain, do a hell of a good job. It is regrettable that so many of them have to get lost, but it is a tough business, and they all figure that parachutists have nine lives. Jim Gavin was the right man to lead these men. Next week, in Part 2, we will hear their stories. The All-American Legacy Podcast is brought to you by the 82nd Airborne Division Public Affairs Office. Please tune in next week, next Tuesday, for part two of the day before the day. Uh, Just one note, uh, Keith Nightingale made reference to the term leg, the expression used by uh, General Gavin. Leg refers to non-airborne infantrymen. It's a uh, World War II term that's still kind of around. Uh, That's what he was referring to there. So next week, the day before the day, part two, where you can hear our paratroopers from D-Day in their own words.